<laughs> okay. Welcome everybody to our 16th session, uh, especially spotlight in rural medicine with Dr. Jeffrey Luna. If you have any questions regarding our program, please contact us on Instagram at virtual shadowing or email us at virtual shadowing at gmail.com. As always, these recorded sessions are going to be posted on our YouTube channel, Pre-Health Virtual Shadowing. Next, please. Next slide, please, Jeff. So our upcoming sessions are technology and medicine, AI and new in innovations. After that, a spiritual career in medicine. And after that, we have our very own Dr. Fowler joining us again in humanity in medicine. So join us on Zoom or YouTube Live at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Now, this mm -hmm. is the working group for this entire program. We have Reagan, Shayon, Taylor, Elena, Rachel, myself, uh, Ani, Ruth, and Miriam. And we also have two wonderful providers, Dr. Raymond Fowler and Dr. Brandon Morchetti. Dr. Fowler, would you like to say anything? It's so good to have you all back. This, um, for those that are online, they over 1,000 of you now. Uh, uh, we've been going now, this is our 16th session and uh, we've been blessed to have over 22,000 people who've joined us on the website so far, representing over 720 universities worldwide for our episodes in virtual shadowing. Your way to connect with a physician online during these very difficult times of being able to get clinical medicine opportunities. Uh, next slide, please, Jeff. Um, Oh, this is my part. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, okay. Um, now, uh, Rachel, can you explain about the questions in chat? Please? Yes. So we will have two Q&A sessions during this talk, one in the middle and one at the very end. If you have any questions about the assessment, please, please, please wait until the very end. We will talk about it after our last Q&A. And as always, this will last about one and a half hours to two hours, and this will be a great talk. Back to you, Dr. Fowler. And next slide, please. All of you, it's, it's the working group's true honor to, um, to present to you a very unique individual. Um, uh, we got a guy here who grew up in a small town, went out and got educated, and then went back home to practice medicine. Jeff Luna is a family medicine physician. He grew up and practices in Livingston, Texas. He went to Texas A&M for undergrad, and he went then directly, <clears throat> excuse me, into the A&M Health Science Center's partnership for primary care program. Jeff Luna hits all the high points of someone who has come home to be part of the lives of the people that he, with whom he grew, grew up. He does family medicine in his hometown. He owns his own practice. Uh, Jeff is a member of the Texas Medical Board, the board that regulates physicians for the state of Texas and does many other things. He's an inpatient manager for Cigna Health. He serves on the Rural Health Task Force under the Department of Agriculture. He serves on the advisory court for St. Luke's Memorial. He is the medical director of two nursing homes and hospice care and home health companies. He's done so many things. I hope that you will all put in chat, welcome Dr. Jeff Luna. And Jeff, it is an absolute pleasure as someone myself who went home to practice medicine. I'm, I know that the only way you can get that feeling is to go home and be around the people that you grew up with and take care of them and their kids and some of them their grandkids. So Jeff, thank you for taking the time out of your amazing schedule. And would you please tell us all about yourself and what it is you do? Hey, wonderful. I sure appreciate the uh, introduction, Dr. Fowler. It has been a real pleasure working with you and Rachel uh, putting this presentation together. And um, it, it brought back a lot of good memories and, and reminded me why I came home to practice. Um, let me go to the next slide. <clears throat> so I grew up in Livingston, Texas. We moved here when I was two years old. My dad had just finished family practice residency, and my mom was a pharmacist, and they had met on an Indian reservation outside of San Antonio, um, fell in love, got married, had me, and the reason my dad came to Livingston was his residency buddy, Dr. Jerry Wood, 
was born and raised in Livingston and said, why don't you come back and practice with me? So my dad said, well, I don't want to really go to a small Texas town. I'd like, I'd like to go back home to Albuquerque, but I'll go there and try it out for a year, but then I'm going back to Albuquerque. He came for a year and stayed through now. So he really loved it and I love it also. Um, it's a small town now of about 5,000 people. It, Livingston serves as the county seat for Polk County, Texas, which has a population of about 45,000 people. When I was growing up though, in grade school, we only had about 3,500 people here. Um, our first Walmart opened up when I was in third grade, and that was a big deal. This was the first super Walmart that we had. And it was just amazing that you could buy milk and car oil and a t-shirt all in the same store. Uh, it was so exciting that I remember my classmates, a lot of them had their parents check my classmates out of school to go to Walmart on opening day because it was that big an event in our town. Um, my earliest memories, I mean, we had two red lights in town. My dad, um, like you, Dr. Fowler, a health nut, he would ride his bicycle to work, ride it to um, the store, ride it to the bank, pick us up from school on his bicycle. It was an old bike. He would put me on the front bar <clears throat> and my sister would hang on from the, the, the panniered side. Um, and take us home whenever he had to pick us up. Fortunately, my mom picked us up most days. But uh, that's the kind of small town uh, environment that we grew up in. Um, the, the office that I'm practicing in now, that I moved into, the, the previous doctor um, that founded that office used to actually smoke cigarettes in his office, bring patients back, um, to his actual administrative office, talk to him, write him a prescription, and then write on a little index card their, medical, their diagnosis and what he gave them, and that was their medical record. This was a previous generation. And whenever he sold his practice to my current partner, the medical record was a shoebox full of index cards. So, I mean, we've gone through a big growth in Livingston in terms of um, how we practice and the town and the red lights and everything. Um, in my youth, there were four primary care doctors and one general surgeon, and that was it. There was no OB doctor, no, ortho, no orthopedic surgeon. Um, family practice ran the ERs um, at the time, uh, no other specialists. Uh, there were 250 people in my graduating class uh, when I graduated in 2002. Um, the next slide. So um, my mom is, is Chinese and she really pushed education. She really wanted us to be doctors and professionals and et cetera. Um, by the time I graduated, my school was a 4A school district. I played varsity tennis, but I wasn't that good. But in a small town, you don't have to be that good to make varsity. We didn't, want to, we didn't win a lot of matches. My kind of claim to fame was I did UIL number sense and I loved it. For some reason, I had a special knack at doing this kind of mental math um, uh, type contest and I placed in state twice. So people thought I was real smart. I graduated salutatorian, but I'll tell you, I came from a small town and I worked hard in high school, but I was really scared going to college. I failed nearly all my AP tests. I took two, two years of high school chemistry advanced in AP chemistry. And I remember I got a one on my AP test. So I was shaking in my shoes going to college, hoping I would last at least a semester. Um, my mom drove me to, uh, for those of you in the Houston area, uh, Roger is Ronnie's test master prep program, which is an SAT prep course. And I spent two summers there. I only made a 1390. So it was okay, but, but I, was, I was on notice going to college that I, I, better, I better do okay. I went to Texas A&M, uh, worked hard, uh, majored in biomedical science, which was at the time just kind of a general um, pre-medicine, uh, pre-pharmacy, pre-health type major. Did good, ended up with a 3.89. I didn't have to take the MCAT, uh, which was really lucky for me because I was accepted into the Partnership for Primary Care Program, which is a joint acceptance program uh, that you apply for while you're in high school 
and it, you get accepted to college and medical school at the same time. Um, but in the contract, you can't apply, you cannot apply to other uh, medical schools. Um, you have to maintain like a, a three, six, I think, um, while you're in college. I worked in college. I, I missed, you know, uh, the, the people in my biology class outnumbered the people in my graduating class. So I was, I came home a lot. I worked as a waiter at a barbecue restaurant in Livingston and um, learned how to deal with people, um, all different kinds of people as a waiter. It was one of my favorite jobs I've ever had. While I was, um, so I graduated from college and I went to uh, Texas A&M Medical School, um, which was in College Station, split up between College Station and uh, Temple and Round Rock at the time, rotated in all three areas. One of my uh, attendings at Christus Santa Rosa in San Antonio, Dr. Leah Mabry, um, told me on a rotation and it really stuck with me. Uh, she said, Jeffrey, you either have a seat at the table or you are on the menu. And throughout this presentation, I'll give several quotes that um, people who really made an impact in my life um, gave me that I remember to this day. So after that quote, I, deter I was determined that I really wanted to be involved and um, uh, really have a say in, in trying to direct my future career-wise, um, especially in primary care. Um, you really have to fight for what you get in primary care, um, and especially in a rural area. Yeah, you really need to be involved on the um, political and administrative side. So in medical school, I had just finished college. My parents, fortunately, I was so fortunate, they paid for college, but they did not pay for medical school. I wasn't any kind of financial guru, but I learned that I could just borrow all the money I needed to go through medical school. So I went down to the basement of the financial office and a lady there uh, asked me how much I wanted to borrow. And I just said, well, how much can I get? And she said something like $37,000 per year divided 50% each semester. So I said, well, give me the maximum. So I signed a piece of paper. I don't even know if I showed her my ID, but all of a sudden I had $19,000 in my bank account and I loved it. I felt like I had hit the lottery and I literally, spent money like I was Paris Hilton, ate at all the finest restaurants. You know, that was the kind of money that some of my classmates had a wife and two kids that they lived on, but I was foolish at the time. The silver lining to that is I knew damn well that if I didn't graduate, I was gonna be in a real pickle because these loans were not bankruptable. So it would follow me to the grave. So that, that was an extra motivation to study hard, which was good because I graduated at the bottom of my class. And I'll tell you, you know, you guys get a lot of blue blooded, um, uh, high pollutant speakers come through here. But for those of you who are struggling and who, who aren't going to Harvard, uh, I want you to know that you're gonna do okay too. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm making it. Uh, another quote, I can't remember his name, but he came to talk to us at the Texas A&M Medical School class. And this stuck with me and I didn't believe it at the time, but I'll put my hand on the Bible that it's true. It's the one third, one third, one third rule. And this is the top third of your class is the smartest, the middle third make the best doctors and the bottom third make the most money. I don't know why that is, but it, 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 it materializes. Let's see, next slide. So I graduated medical school. I went to John Peter Smith Hospital for residency. JPS, I loved it. It was the largest family medicine residency program in the country, still is. And it's an unopposed residency, meaning they don't have uh, internal medicine and family practice in the same program. The reason that was important for me is a lot of the medicine and training between IMED and family practice overlap. And sometimes you don't wanna get into a situation where you're fighting for, for patients or turf or an experience. So we had, the, we had full run of the hospital 
In fact, they didn't even start an ER program until my second or third year there. Um, so we were, we were the ER doctors and everything. It was wonderful. My favorite rotations were the ICU and ER rotations. Man, that was fun. Um, everything's changing, moving. We got to really become proficient in procedures. We intubated patients. We put in central lines, thoracentesis, paracentesis, lumbar punctures. I even did a Swan Gans catheter. Um, it was wonderful. We got to learn a lot of the things that you need to do when you go to a rural community. The best time of my life. Um, you were a doctor. People were calling you doctor. Um, you were making a little bit of money. Um, and the end was in sight. I knew I didn't want to specialize. Um, and I knew I had 36 months and I was out of there. When I graduated residency, I was so happy. I actually drove back and left all my furniture in my old apartment. So someone pleasantly must have inherited a couple nice couches and a uh, old tube style television. While I was there, I met the future Dr. Vian Pham. She was a medical student at the time from UT Southwestern doing her family practice rotation at JPS. And I was doing like a surgery rotation or something like that. Um, I met her. Um, I thought, man, there's no way she's going to date me. These UC Southwestern folks are so hoity toities. You know, they're not, she's not going to date some family practice. Right? I'm just going to ask her out. She'll say no. And then I can tell myself I gave it a try. So lo and behold, you can see us there in the bottom left corner picture. That's her daughter. She's uh, 14 months old now. And we got another one on the way. Um, I guess I kind of copied my dad with the bicycle, but I don't put my child on the, that bar um, right there anymore. I, I got a little trailer to hook up. So she's more comfortable back there, but we have a good time. And she, she loves Livingston too. And she never thought she'd come to a small town. So everything worked out. I finished in 2013, drove home and started practice one week later. So like, I think I graduated August, 30th or 31st on, I believe it was like July 7th, I saw my first patient in my clinic. So I've been preparing, you know, several weeks before and interviewing and stuff like that. As far as the practice that I started, I was real fortunate uh, and am fortunate. My dad had, um, had the building, a large building. It was him and two uh, partners who were there. I came in, we're all separate. Uh, we're sole proprietors, but I came in and already had kind of a, a, a informal type setup. The office manager helped me get credential with insurance. Um, it was already furnished uh, with patient tables and things like that. So it was about as smooth a, a path as you can take. And I'm, I'm real fortunate for that. Uh, Dr. Luna, uh, so we have a quick question so far. Do you wish that you had taken a break after residency? Absolutely not. I had $150,000 in debt I had to offload. I, I had to make some money and I was ready to get out. I wasn't going to go live with my parents. I needed to make some money and, and work. And you know, I love what I do. It's not stressful. Actually, vacations stress me out. The first couple of days of vacations, I'm antsy checking my computer. I just, I love, I love what I'm doing. So, um, but I would not have extended my residency. So it was a great experience. Man, I loved it. JPS, you can't, can't get a better training uh, for what I do, but um, I never stepped foot back in JPS afterwards, but I remember it very, very fondly. And I still keep in contact with the program director, uh, Dr. Casey. Jeff, we, had a, we just had a comment that said, this guy needs to go to a casino. He's the luckiest man alive. <laughs> <laughs> And, and you know, I think you are, Jay. <laughs> it's been, it's uh, been, I do have one question. Did, did you call us UT Southwestern folks snobs? Is that what I heard? Yeah, you heard it crystal clear, Dr. Fowler. <laughs> That's because y'all are so darn smart. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever. This is okay. great. Please go. So after residency, again, I think I covered this already. Drove back. I discovered, um, kind of looks like you, Dr. Fowler, discovered Dave Ramsey. And um, uh, I quickly became a follower of his. 
worked hard, paid off debt, paid the mortgage off. And for those of you watching right now, I'm not related to Dave Ramsey, I'm not paid by Dave Ramsey, but I recommend you look at his YouTube videos and check out his website. Really changed my life because I'll tell you, part of enjoying your work in medicine, part of enjoying your work in rural medicine, and part of having the flexibility to choose a specialty that you love is you can't be saddled by debt. It limits the, the, the number of moves you can make in life and your ability to pivot uh, to encounter different situations. So an interesting case, there was a 36 year old, uh, very handsome, uh, previously healthy male who was deep sea fishing in Alaska last week. He uh, flew in from Juneau to fish camp, got on the boat immediately, turned green with nausea, thrown up off the side, put a scopolamine patch on, um, still got sick. It's supposed to be put on several hours before you, you go out in the boat, but uh, you know, he wasn't the best planner. Put another scopolamine patch on, um, uh, next day, did great on the boat. Day after that, woke up and couldn't see anything. Couldn't see anything up close. Couldn't read, couldn't see his watch, couldn't type text, couldn't read what he was texting. Far vision was preserved, was afraid he was going blind. Was trying to check and make sure his disability insurance was paid up. Then he thought about it a little more and realized that double dose gum scopolamine was the reason he couldn't see anything up close. It dilates your pupils, causes blurry vision. Uh, he removed his scopolamine patches and three days later, sight was restored. And that patient was me. There's my picture there. Um, the two guys in the front are my good buddies. The one with the, uh, uh, on the left is uh, Frank Denton. He was a previous member of the medical board. The right is George Deloach, orthopedic surgeon, current member. And then the back gentleman there is a, an attorney, uh, Lewis. So, uh oh, hold on a second. There we go. So, other symptoms of scopolamine um, uh, dry eyes, dry mouth, urinary retention, headache, and irritability. So, what do I do on a regular basis? Clinic is my core, that's the core of my practice. Every family practitioner, clinic, if you hate clinic, don't do family practice. Um, I go to the hospital and do my own hospital work, and I'm the inpatient manager for Cigna Health Springs, which means I'm like the hospitalist for Cigna Health Springs, which is our predominant Medicare Advantage plan in this region. So usually I'll round in the hospital uh, before clinic. Um, I'll do morning clinic, uh, go home and have lunch, maybe go back to the hospital, then do afternoon clinic, and then come home. There are three nursing homes in town. Um, and I have patients at all three. I have about um, 75, probably 80 patients total between all three nursing homes. And I serve as medical director for two of the nursing homes, a home health company and a hospice company. I think we'll get to that, uh, more about that in a later slide. So how is rural medicine different? Well, you're rural, right? So you have less specialists to lean on. If I need to talk, if I need to consult a neurosurgeon or an interventional radiologist um, or a uh, uh, ear, nose, and throat doctor, I don't have that ability. We don't have those specialists here. Um, however, you are more, more emotionally tied to the community. Um, you're, you're really vested with your patients when you take care of them and you also see some of their family members and you also bump into them at Walmart, and you also have mutual friends, it, it really puts you enmeshed in their lives. And um, I love it. it. Makes me feel good. Jeff, do you, uh, do, do, do members of your community have your cell phone? They just call you at home or Absolutely. wherever? Absolutely. They have, a lot of people have my cell phone. A lot of patients have it too. And you know what? No, no one really abuses it. Um, in fact, Sometimes I'll ask why they didn't call me and, you know, when they should have called me. and they'll say that they were afraid to bother me and things like that. So I actually have to encourage people to call me. Um, but definitely I'm very easily reachable. Uh, you're a big fish in a small pond. 
The downside, of course, is you're, you're more vulnerable to the gossip and, you know, good news spreads fast, bad news spreads fast, dur, um, and uh, that's just the way it is. It, it's a, a downside, but I still love it and uh, it, it's not outweighed by the benefits. Dr. Luna, so what kind of cases do you send out since you have less specialists to lean Excellent on? Excellent question. So if someone comes through the emergency room and they clearly need a specialist that we don't have, we transfer that patient, the ER doctor will transfer that patient out from the emergency room. If they get admitted to the hospital, let's say with pneumonia and I'm treating them um, and then they in turn develop an acute condition or worsening of their conditioning that requires a specialist, then I'll transfer them out. So um, if someone comes in with chest pain, this is a very common issue. They come to the ER with chest pain, their troponin heart enzymes, the, the first one was negative, the second one was negative. I'll admit them to the hospital, to our observation unit and monitor them, give them aspirin, give them a beta blocker, um, give them an ACE inhibitor, put them on telemetry. And then let's say during their stay, one of their heart enzymes shoots up. Well, we don't have a cath lab at our hospital. So that would be a case where we need to transfer that patient out. I want to mention okay. that- Hey, Jeff, Jeff how, how far away is your cath lab? About 45 miles, 40 miles north in Lufkin. How do you arrange for inter-facility transfer from one hospital to the other one? You have a critical care transport or what do you do? So we'll, we'll contact that hospital. I'll speak with the hospitalist and cardiologist. Mm -hmm. And when they accept and we have a bed assignment, the ambulance jets them over. And sometimes if we need to transfer someone to Houston, um, uh, you know, a helicopter can go and come get them. Um, it, it, it's not, it has not been a, a big problem. Will you uh, send someone, for example, on a, a TPA drip or something uh, and someone's having an MI? Absolutely. And, and we'll do um, uh, thrombolytics and acute strokes, uh, ischemic strokes um, before they're transferred and then send them out to see a neurologist. I work with the Mission Lifeline Project here, which for the folks listening is the heart attack network for this region up here in North Texas. Do you track your time in, time out on those patients in terms of, you know, because you know, you're what's called a transfer hospital. So we all <clears throat> do quality metrics on your time in, time out on those patients. The, the hospital administration keeps up with that. And when I was chief of staff, we'd get those reports. Um, now there's a different chief of staff going through that. But absolutely, you have, despite being in a rural area, you have to maintain the same standard of care that any patient would get no matter what hospital they were in. So when I'm treating pneumonia or chest pain at the Livingston Hospital with uh, one super Walmart, I have to do the exact same care that that patient would get if they were at Methodist Hospital downtown with that same condition. Now, if that patient then, like we talked about, gets worse and they need a, a different level of care that we can't provide, I'll transfer them out. But while that patient is sitting in bed at Livingston Hospital, they're getting the same medicines and care as they would at any hospital in Texas. And if we can't do that, we don't accept them from the emergency room. We have them transfer them out. Dr. Luna, we also have a question of, do you make house calls as a rural medicine provider? Absolutely. I've, I've gone into many houses. <laughs> um, a lot of patients, you know, they can't, can't get around real good. They're tethered to oxygen. Um, and I have no problem going to houses. In fact, I try to go to um, every person that I refer to hospice. I try to see them uh, that first week in their house myself. Jeff, uh, some of our young students <clears throat> may not know what hospice is. Would you explain that? Absolutely. And there's a slide coming up in a later part of this presentation but it's a, um, uh, a program that Medicare allows for someone with a terminal diagnosis of six months or less, should that diagnosis run an uninterrupted course without treatment. And it's a program that makes sure the patient's comfortable and provides them pain medicine and uh, bereavement services for the family and things like that. 
Uh, Dr. Luna, so we also have, uh, I think a lot of students are curious about what resources you have in your town. So what resources uh, do you have in Livingston? Good question. So we've come a long way from the two red light bicycle rides I used to have in Livingston. Now we have two orthopedic surgeons, 24 hour general surgery call, um, I think three OB gens full time, several pediatricians. We've got a lot of resources, CAT scans, MRIs, um, uh, VQ, nuclear medicine scans, um, perfusion ventilation scans. Um, we have quite a bit now. But we're still a rural hospital and we still got to transfer out. Probably about 5% of the patients that I admit have to be transferred. And then do you know the follow-up or how those patients are when you transfer them out? So a lot of the patients that I see in the hospital are my personal patients. And so I'll follow up with them, um, with the family on how they're doing. Or, um, and if they're discharged from that higher level of care, they'll follow back up with me in the office. So we have that continuity. And I'm always texting family members, how's you know, Mr. Smith doing? Is Miss Jones still on the ventilator uh, in Kingwood? Uh, things like that. So I try to keep tabs on my patients. So rural medicine, here's some uh, statistics. Texas, the second largest state in the union, second to Alaska. And I remember, Rachel, you told me that someone from Alaska is on this uh, uh, wait room or waiting room here. Um, let's see, 87 critical access hospitals, 299 rural health clinics, 186 uh, FQHCs, federally qualified health centers. Livingston has one also. Um, next slide, some more statistics. Um, a lot of residents still don't have health insurance, though that number is decreasing. Um, unemployment rate in rural Texas is about that of urban Texas. Average per capita, $50,000. Rural is uh, $40,000. So if it's not already clear, why rural medicine, why family medicine? I grew up in a rural area I mean, it's what I know. Um, I've always loved it. I've always wanted to be close to home. And I never cared much for the kind of ivory tower medicine. Um, and by that, I mean the uh, 30 story skyscraper that um, you walk into and take an elevator up, you know, to the 27th floor, section A of the Spurlock Tower um, to wait for your doctor. I like kind of being out in the field and uh, being with my patients, seeing them after work, uh, running into them in town, seeing their family members. Um, it, more like a, a uh, general amongst his soldiers, not one stationed in the Pentagon. Uh, I also don't like traffic. Uh, I hate traffic. And there's not a lot of traffic in Livingston, even now. Um, also, so that's why I like rural medicine. As far as family, medicine, it's such a broad field that I can titrate up the areas I like and down the areas I don't like. So um, if you're an ER doctor, um, you can't control what comes into your emergency room. If you don't like taking care of children, you may have a child walk in. If you don't want to do a C-section, you may have a pregnant emergency that requires you to do an emergency section in as an ER doctor. But with me, with my clinic, I am much uh, better equipped to do what I like and not do what I don't like. If I like doing office procedures, which I do, I can, ramp, I can turn that knob up and do a lot of those. If I don't like doing uh, pap smears, I can tell patients I will refer you to the ob -GYN. I don't really do those. So when you have the ability to increase what you like and decrease what you don't like, to me, that really increases my quality of life. Uh, the, the, I like getting up in the morning and going to work. Monday is my favorite day of the week, and Thursday is not, because that's the last day of my work week. Um, so I think family medicine is perfect for me. Dr. Luna, so what is the greatest difficulty you face in serving rural populations? 
you know, we have a lot of, so the rural areas have, has a lot of poverty. It's tough whenever you have a patient that you know what they need uh, to take as a medicine and you know where they need to go to get the appropriate treatment, but they don't have gas money to go there um, or they don't have the copay um, to get their medicine or if they hit the infamous Medicare donut hole. That's really frustrating. And then we try to kind of patch them through and keep them going with samples, but that hurts. It, it, it doesn't feel good to see a patient decline because they can't afford um, to get some basic treatment. Right. Next slide, a day in the life of the clinic slash hospital. Um, so 80% of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is gonna be chronic care management. So cholesterol management, diabetes management, blood pressure management, stuff that patients wake up in the morning knowing that they have this condition and that they're gonna have it their whole lives. Um, 20% of what I do is acute or urgent care, stuff they wake up in the morning and they're not anticipating on getting. So uh, they start to have a fever, they have pneumonia, they uh, fall down and break their back, um, they burns when they pee and they have a urinary tract infection, or if they have one of their chronic conditions that gets a lot worse. So if they have congestive heart failure and then they go out and drink a bunch of water and eat a bunch of salt, um, and they run into CHF uh, exacerbation, get short of breath. Um, they weren't anticipating on that happen. They come to me, that's part of that 20% acute or urgent care. And everybody has their bread and butter. Um, for surgeons, it's gonna be taking out gallbladders and appendixes. For ophthalmologists, it's gonna be cataracts and glaucoma. Uh, for pediatricians, it's gonna be well child checks. Um, and that's just, that's just kind of the way it is. So if you don't like cholesterol management, diabetes and blood pressure, um, family practice isn't for you. And that doesn't matter whether you're in an urban or rural setting. So a case study here, a 45 year old male comes in with increasing fatigue, polyuria, meaning he's urinating a lot, hard time sleeping, um, the symptoms have been going on about three weeks. Um, it doesn't burn when he pees, no chest pain, no cough, no nausea, and his wife complains that he snores a lot. So y'all may hear this and say, what the heck is going on? And you know, actually that's the way it comes in the door to us also. Um, as a primary care provider, it doesn't come in a neat picture. The symptoms sometimes are scattered all over the place and you've got to sort through it and drill through it all. So on the assessment, uh, the past medical history, he has a history of high blood pressure and high cholesterol, no allergies, uh, no surgical history, social drinker, um, occasional smoker, smokes a pack a day for 20 years, drives a truck for a living. Um, his mom has high blood pressure, obesity, dad has hypertension. He's on two medicines. The first one is for uh, blood pressure. The second one is for high cholesterol. Here's his vital signs, a little overweight. On the physical exam, the first two lines basically mean everything is normal um, with his heart and lungs and abdomen. Uh, his mentation is good. The third line, he had acanthosis nigricans noted on his skin. So here's a picture of that. And it's a uh, condition characterized by dark velvety discoloration in the body folds, usually on the skin or a nape of the neck. So next, I did some labs. His urinalysis looked okay, no infection, uh, weekly positive ketones, a little bit dehydrated, but his glucose was off the charts. Here's his chemistry, basically within normal limits, except his sugar was 301, and normal is under 100. His complete blood count looked okay. So the diagnosis for this gentleman was new onset type two diabetes mellitus. These arrows show the diagnostic criteria for diabetes. Um, if you have a hemoglobin A1C, which is a three month average of blood sugars, greater than or equal to 6.5, that's technically diabetes. If you have a fasting plasma glucose, greater than or equal to 126, that's diabetes. 
And what's not on here is if you have um, a random glucose over 200, uh, 200 or above, that's diabetes. So if you go to the county fair and eat a big bag of cotton candy and wash it down with two Dr. Peppers and check your sugar, if you are not diabetic, it should not go above 200. Next slide, treatment plan. So we got a hemoglobin A1C. Uh, even though we knew he was already diabetic, it's a good thing to, to check initially, and then you can trend how his treatment's doing uh, based on that every three months. Um, he has, uh, we gave him some diabetic education. Um, he needed some weight loss, exercise, added some metformin and insulin. Some other uh, symptoms of diabetes are listed here. On one second. So that's his daughter, everyone. She's very Sorry talkative. about that. Sorry, she's running around. So other symptoms of diabetes are listed here that you can read. Okay, uh, Q&A. So we actually had a question of, uh, is, do you find it harder to educate uh, your patients in a rural setting? Um, no. I trained at John Peter Smith Hospital, which I think had 600 something beds in the middle of Fort Worth. And it's, it's always challenging because patients, you know, while we deal with this as physicians and nurses um, on a daily basis, this is something new to a patient. This would be like someone trying to tell me how to change my car oil. And I, you know, I wouldn't have the slightest clue. So it, it's tough to explain the pathophysiology, uh, the treatment, and why we need to do that. Um, to the patient, it's just a pill or an injection a lot of times. And furthermore, it's like a blue pill or a yellow pill. Um, and so it's, it, it's, it's not harder in a rural setting. I think it's hard in, in any setting. Um, do you feel in family medicine that you have to be good at everything? No, absolutely not. Yeah, and, and that's one of the advantages of titrating up and titrating down what you like and don't like. Um, I'm not good at everything. Um, and I don't do a, a lot of stuff that I'm not good at. So I never really liked um, or was good at delivering babies. And so that's 0% of my practice today. So you have to do everything in training. And sometimes you're just gritting your teeth, getting through it. Um, but it's not that bad. And you don't ever have to do it again when you get out. Would you say that rural medicine providers need to put on more hats because there are less specialties, like more hats of what they can do in the field? It certainly will make your life easier in a rural setting um, because you, you, you do have less, depending on how rural you get, you have less uh, resources to draw on. So, what, if you're in a very, very isolated rural setting and you don't do something, then that patient is going to have to drive until they can see a doctor who does do it. So in, in that respect, um, the more hats you wear, the more convenient it is for your patients. Mm -hmm. uh, what qualities do you think a rural physician or provider should have um, as opposed to an urban <laughs> physician or provider? You know, you, you, I think there was a movie. What's that movie with, um, is it Doc Hollywood? Or I may be saying the wrong movie, but you, you got to love the country. <clears throat> you have to love country people. Um, you, you, uh, you have to be patient. Um, you have to be willing to explain stuff a couple of times. Um, but I think if you can function in a rural area, I think you can function in an urban area. And I think if you're a good doctor in an urban area, you can function well as a rural practitioner. Um, it's just the lifestyle you want to leave, lead. Um, but you, I think that person would do great wherever. That's a great point. If, great. if you're not a good doctor in an urban area or rural area, you're not going to be good at the other place either. That's the counter. <laughs> Counterpoint. Um, when practicing in a rural area, do you see more cases of patients having financial issues? If so, how do you approach that issue? 
it's tough. I, I think that rural, uh, the more rural you get, I think, I think it's my, I'm an expert in my opinion, but I think there's more poverty, the, the more rural you get. Um, and so it, it's tough. You try to use cheaper medicines. Um, you uh, try to use a bunch of samples, you know, give patients samples to tide them over until they can get their medicine. Um, really, the, the cheapest thing you can do is focus on lifestyle. You know, there, there's, there's no amount of money that can overcome a crappy diet and lack of exercise. Um, and so the, the more you can get a patient focused on what they put in their mouths and how long they wear their walking shoes, um, the cheaper and better they're going to be off. So. I think a couple people were actually still curious about your residency program. Um, are unopposed residency programs still common or do many residencies split into specialties? So um, there are, well, let me think how to, there's some echo there, but uh, there are a lot of unopposed family practice programs because there's a lot of community family practice programs. Um, I think that, and I may be wrong, but I believe that anywhere there's an internal medicine residency program, I think there's also a family medicine program. And that's the same at UT Southwestern. However, not everywhere that there's a family medicine program, is there an internal medicine program. Um, so as a lot of our members are pre-PA, do you work with any PAs and do you know if PAs can go into rural medicine? So I don't work with any PAs. Um, I don't employ any, but there are uh, PAs here. Uh, the, the main one I'm thinking of works for our hospital in the radiology department and he is busy as busy can get. He does a lot of the interventional procedures in our hospital. Um, so if someone needs a PICC line or a paracentesis or a, a biopsy, um, he'll, do those, he'll do those procedures. PAs have, have a huge role to play um, in our healthcare communities, both in the urban and rural areas, absolutely. And they can be busy wherever they wanna be busy. Um, a lot of our students loved that you were honest about your debt and how you overcame with it. Can you talk a little bit more about, you know, being a fan of Dave Ramsey and how you got over your debt? Absolutely. So um, I was, again, thank, thank God, I, I started medical school with no debt, um, but, and I went to a public state medical school, which was critical because had I walked into Ross University Medical School and they asked me how much I wanted to borrow, and I would have still would have said, just give me the maximum. And I would have graduated with probably half a million dollars of debt as opposed to 150,000. Um, you have to live far, far below your means if you're coming out of residency with six figure debt. And if you don't get a hold and grab a hold of it and kill that debt um, in a professional way, your life is, is kind of over uh, before it begins because you're not, able to, you're not able to do the things you need to do and have the, the freedom that you wanna have. It, it crushes your soul and that in turn will hinder your, um, your revenue. It just creates a negative energy around you uh, a depression. You've got to live way below your means. I would suggest living like you were a resident, even when you graduate and become an attending. And if you do that, invest a ton of money um, in index funds, um, you're, you're going to be fine. Um, how much do you utilize public health theory or aspects in your practice in educating your patients? So I'm um, Reading the AAFP magazines, um, the we have another family practice. Actually, I have one right here. Family practice news, it's very good. I read these things, um, and you have to stay within the standard of care. Again, whether you're in a rural area or urban setting, you can't, you know, tell someone to 
to eat ginger in a small town for a, a pneumonia um, and give them antibiotics if you're in a city. You have to do kind of the same thing. So, so we're always using uh, the most up-to-date uh, recommendations and public health um, protocols. Awesome. Um, I think some of our students are curious on how you deal with mental health as a family care provider in a rural community. So we see, I mean, one of the most prevalent things you're going to see is depression. Um, and so we've got to be able to treat that at least at a, a PCP level. Um, I'll prescribe antidepressants. Um, I don't do counseling in terms of, you know, sit with me for an hour and, and talk to me and, and I'm not a licensed counselor, but I'll prescribe the medicine and then refer the patient to a counselor who can, who can do some counseling. And the way I kind of um, uh, give an example to the patient is the medicine is kind of like uh, the putting the soap on the floor and the counseling is the mop that scrubs, you know, you have to have both. Um, and when you do that, you get kind of a synergistic effect and, and really helps, helps the patient. We also, so fortunate, thank goodness, we have the Burke Center, um, which is a multi-county mental health um, program facility that, that sees a lot of our sickest mental health patients. Awesome. Um, there is a lot of questions. <laughs> um, Pick me out some easy ones, Rachel. Uh, I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> um, how do you deal with the challenge of remaining objective when treating patients you know personally? So, good question. So, in a small town, you know a lot of people personally. I have a lot of people. So, um, you know, the, the thing you're, someone quote told me um, once that uh, it's doing the right thing in hard is knowing what the right thing is. Yeah, so in, an, in essence, what you're supposed to do with the patient is pretty clear cut in my field. So um, it's, it's pretty straightforward. Sometimes I'll have a, uh, two people who are divorced from each other who see me and complain about the other person. And uh, it, it's interesting, but the right thing to do by that patient is the right thing. And so it's, it's, um, it's not that hard to, to do so. Perhaps in another specialty, it'd be different, but uh, I have not really had a lot of challenges in terms of um, staying objective. And then let's see, let's do one more question and then we'll continue on to uh, the session. Um, do you think that the malpractice risk is greater or less in a rural environment? Um, I don't know. I, you know, I, I pay thousands and thousands of dollars a year in malpractice insurance. Uh, I have not been ever sued, knock on wood, but I think that the closer bond you have with your patient and their families, uh, the better in every sense, including from a malpractice standpoint. Patients wanna know that you care. And if you care and they know you care, um, you're kind of like their family. And um, not that it never happens, but family usually doesn't sue family. That's <laughs> true. All right, I think we can move on. Okay, next slide. Job as a medical director. So I'm the medical director of two nursing homes, a home health company and a hospice company uh, here in Polk County. Um, the thread that runs between all three or four um, as my job as a medical director is um, I'll meet periodically with the staff and leadership of these organizations. Um, I will uh, review charts, uh, review uh, formularies of medications and make sure that we're um, providing the right medicines for the patients. A huge part of it is making sure that patients continue to meet admission criteria. Um, so for hospice uh, patients, they have to have a life expectancy of six months or less should that terminal diagnosis continue unimpeded. 
Uh, for home health, they have to be homebound, and there are several criteria for homebound. For nursing home patients, they have to meet criteria to stay as a long-term care Medicaid recipient, or, uh, or if they're being skilled in therapy, they have to meet therapy criteria. So those are always uh, interesting, and, and it, it provides a different flavor to my day, and that's why I like it. I didn't want to just do clinic all day and then come home. Um, so I get to, it's almost like changing the channel on the TV. And, uh, and that's why I do what I do. And that kind of leads uh, us to, go ahead. Sorry, can you go over some examples of medical policies, patient care and admission criteria you oversee as a medical director? So um, we are, the, the organizations are always trying to admit as many people as they can, right? That's how they um, stay in business. That's how they take care of people. That's how they keep their nurses busy. Um, so what I do is look at the patients they're trying to admit and give them a green light or a red light on them based on their clinical criteria. Um, if the nurses out in the field, when the nurses go out and see the patient, once they're admitted, if they are admitted, um, they can call me with any questions or, hey, the, the patient's had a decline, I'll give some orders and they can draw some blood work out there. Or um, sometimes I'll say, send the patient to the ER. Um, uh, sometimes I'll instruct the nurse on how to educate the patient on what to expect coming up next. You know, the patient's gonna be sleeping more. Um, they may stop breathing for periods of time uh, if they're on hospice and that's part of the process. And what that does is save the patient the, discomfort of an ER visit uh, where they're told the same thing and then come home. Awesome. All right. Cool. Green light. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Deal with dealing with death and end of life. So this is a big part of my uh, uh, life as a hospice medical director and also as a uh, clinician. Um, Dr. Alterman, who was my ICU attending at John Peter Smith Hospital, told this to us when we asked if he gets how you know if he gets rattled when a patient dies because in the ICU patients are dying a lot that's a, a I don't want to say common occurrence but it's not unusual uh, in that critical of patient and what he said I agree with and it, it rang true that death and dying is part of being a doctor you cannot let yourself get too down internally when that happens the satisfaction that you take in treating patients cannot just be that they get better. Uh, if they get worse, you must take satisfaction in knowing that you did the right thing by the patient, despite them getting worse. That being said, we're all human and we all make mistakes. And um, if you make a mistake that uh, you shouldn't have made and a patient suffered for it, it feels horrible. Um, but that's how I deal with death and dying. And we deal with that on a, a, a weekly and monthly basis somewhere in the practice, at some part of the practice. Do you have a specific case that stood out most to you of someone dying with you? And like, how did you deal with it? You know, not a, not a specific case, but I, I would say that um, as a physician, a family practice physician, I, I really care about all my patients. Some of them I got to know more than others. And um, some of them I knew before I became a doctor. Some of them I knew before I went to college. And so when I'm taking care of those patients and, you, you know, you see their decline and, um, and they, they get on hospice or they pass away, um, it does hit hard. It hit hard. It hits hard on a, a, a personal level, um, and it's tough. But I, what I do is I, I make myself available to the um, surviving spouse or family members, and they all have my cell phone. Many of them have my cell phone number, um, and I'll call them too if they don't call me and just check on them and see how they're doing. We'll schedule follow-up appointments if I'm uh, taking care of any of the other family members. Um, but it's tough. But it's it's very rewarding. Do you have any life lessons that you've learned from these patients? Uh, yes, you get to see both ends of a spectrum. You get to see a 
people reflecting on a life well lived and it makes you want to um, someday have that breath of rich experiences to look back on. And you also get to see patients who have, um, uh, you know, squandered a lot of opportunity uh, through bad healthcare decisions and bad choices. And you get, to, you know, patients who are dying alone, people who you can't get a hold of their family members to sign a consent um, to get them on hospice or, um, you know, th that's tough too. And so in both cases, it makes you want to strengthen the relationships that are important to you and really soak in all you can in this life until we get to our end. Thank you for sharing that. Next question, how do I balance everything? It's easy, piece of cake, and I'm not being sarcastic. My clinic hours, um, actually, my clinic patient visits are 8 to 10, 15 in the morning and 1.30 to 2.30 in the afternoon. Usually, I don't get out till maybe 10.30 or 11 in the morning and then uh, 2.45 or 3 uh, in the afternoon. So it's not that strenuous. But to do that, you have to be very efficient. Um, what I always call my staff, I have a receptionist, two nurses, and a biller. And I call them my SEAL Team Six because they are on the ball. They are the, the, the receptionist is manning the phones, checking people in and out, doing referrals, uh, following up, checking phone messages all at the same time and with a smile on her face. My nurses prep the chart like a, like a, like a SEAL Team Six. They, they put in the, um, a, a lot of the, uh, HPI, they update the chart, um, they're quick with their vital signs, they're efficient, they're smiling, the patients love them, um, and uh, uh, it makes it very easy on my part then uh, to visit with the patient and complete my part of the chart. My biller, second to none, um, fills stuff out and collects it and follows up on denials like it was her money being stolen from her purse. Um, wonderful. So you have to be efficient. And if you're like, if you're efficient, you don't have to work as hard. And if you don't have to work as hard, you spend more time with your family. So it's easier to balance. Um, you have to have a good biller to do that. Now consider the source, right? I'm a private practice doctor. So I'm gonna tell you that being self-employed is best. And um, as Dave Ramsey says, I'm an expert in my opinion, but uh, I will explain why I think that's the case. When I was a medical student rounding at St. Joseph's Hospital in College Station, Bryan College Station, Texas, I was sitting down with the hospitalist who looked like he was in his 60s. We were talking a little bit about the business finance side. And he said, Jeffrey, when you're working for someone, a third of your revenue goes to overhead, a third goes to your employer, and a third goes to you. Well, that's very true. And if you look at those ratios, if you're your own employer, then you get to keep two of those one-third slices of the pie. And if you get to keep two of those one-third slices of the pie, you don't have to work as hard to provide for your family. And then if you don't have to work as hard, uh, you can spend more time with your family. It makes balancing easier. And not to beat a dead horse again, but if you don't have debt, and that means student loan debt. That means if you don't have a $2 million mansion that you're living in, you're not driving in a, a mortgage Rolls Royce, you don't have to work as hard. You don't have to run as hard on that financial treadmill to make a living. Um, I know a lot of doctors making five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000 a year who if anything happened and they, God bless them, if they only made $450,000, they'd lose their house. And in that kind of situation, it is impossible to balance work and family because you just cannot work enough to pay your debtors. So fear debt. So you mentioned that your wife, Dr. Pham, is also a provider, family medicine provider, correct? Um, how do y'all... 
uh, how do y'all balance that out, especially raising your beautiful daughter? I wish I could say it was more challenging. I mean, she has the same office hours I do. Um, she has no debt on her practice. Um, we have a babysitter that comes, you know, during our work day and watches the baby and the babysitter speaks only Spanish to the child. So we're hoping to raise a bilingual or a trilingual uh, baby actually being uh, my wife speaks Vietnamese to the child and I'm in charge of the English. So it's, it's pretty easy. We go on vacations, uh, we have a good time. We go to Houston a lot. The other thing I, I guess, uh, thank you for reminding me. I live in a rural area and a lot of the people here may think that a rural area means you never get to sit at a restaurant with a tablecloth, you know, for the rest of your life. Guys, I am one hour away from entering, boarding a gate on United plane with a direct flight to Beijing or New York city. Okay. One hour away from Bush airport. I'm an hour away from sitting at Del Frisco's Steakhouse ordering a bone-in filet. A lot of people who live in the city, they travel an hour anyway to get where they need to go. So it's really not that bad. I Next think slide. you're inspiring so many people to go towards yeah. Rome. Come, join, come to Livingston. Come to Livingston. <laughs> <laughs> um, a quick question about, you know, balance. Do you find yourself kind of nearing burnout, which it seems like you're not, but you know, do you ever have those thoughts of burnout and what do you do about it? The people who burn out, I think either don't really like what they're doing or are doing what they're doing too much. In family medicine, if I don't like a part of my practice, I just don't do it. So I'm not doing stuff that I don't like to do. And if you look at my office hours, I'm definitely not doing too much. Um, so I'm, I'm not anywhere near burnout. I love what I do and I can do it um, for as long as I can, you know, walk, talk. Awesome. Um, yeah, we're good to go to the next slide. Okay. Hey Jeff, uh, Fowler here. <clears throat> you know, it's, it's interesting on the, on the admissions committee, we really screen students to see if they can, you know, since as many as 60% of physicians express cynicism and feeling near burned out, we're trying to ask how folks who are applicants to medical school will be able to prevent that from happening to themselves, how they will mitigate against that. Do you have any thoughts about that? What causes the burnout and how they can mitigate? Well, as a medical, as a college student, I was burned out and scared. As a medical student, I was really burned out and scared. As a resident, I worked hard and loved it. So there's a time in your life when you're supposed to be burned out. And, uh, and that time is what a lot of, is the time a lot of these viewers are watching. That's the time they're in. Um, and that's kind of the way it goes. But for the marathon, for the 40 year part of your life, which is your career, um, you gotta take vacations. You can't work too much. Um, you got to love what you do. I, I don't go to work hating my boss. I, I don't have a vice president of clinical operations that doesn't like me and gives me a hard time. Um, and so that's a part of being self-employed that increases your um, satisfaction with work and decreases your burnout. I know that if I want to stop working today, um, I can survive a long time because I don't have a lot of debt. Um, minimizing debt decreases burnout, I believe, because you're not forced to do something um, uh, just to keep your head above water. But, but college, medical school, even maybe even residency, burnout is, is there. So I just draw on the, you know, as far as in that stage of my life, um, we really draw on the, the, the strengths of our friends and, and spend time with friends and, and, and uh, make the most of our downtime. Thank you, Jeff. The next slide, how has COVID-19 affected my practice? Um, guys, it had the potential to take a huge shark bite out of my practice because 80% of what I do, like I mentioned, is elective. If you are 75 years old and worried about getting coronavirus, it's not gonna be real high on your priority list to come let me check your cholesterol. Um, so we went through a week or two of uh, 
you know, an uh uh-oh kind of pit feeling in our stomachs. My partners and I. Um, Fortunately, uh, by I think executive decree on the federal and state level, we were able to expand our uh, telemedicine access to Medicare patients, which are the majority of my patients. And that had that has really um, put some water under our boat here. Um, you have to, whether you sell hamburgers or uh, plumbing equipment or run a practice, you have to be able to pivot and adapt to survive. And uh, telemedicine was my partners and I doing some adapting. Um, because of that, we were able to, to keep seeing our patients, keep our staff employed. Um, we did take a hit. We um, got some of that payroll protection plan uh, grant, which really helped. Um, but I feel like from a business standpoint, we have uh, come out on the other end and are going to be okay. Of course, COVID is still you know, around and in our community, but, uh, but now I, I know we're going to be just fine. Um, the other fortunate thing about being in a rural area is um, we weren't hit as hard with coronavirus as the urban areas. Um, I know that my friend in uh, Parkland, Dr. Mary Chang, I think told me that Dallas was under lockdown for a much, much longer time than, than we were. Um, may still be under lockdown. Are y'all still under lockdown? Are restaurants open and everything up there? We're currently at a uh, phase two of uh, reopening. So uh, yeah, with a uh, 50% capacity, restaurants are open. Okay. So just COVID fortunately didn't hit us um, near as hard. Also as part of our adapting and pivoting, um, we adopted almost a Sonic like model, uh, the restaurant chain. So we would talk to patients on the phone or tell them at, uh, uh, FaceTime, and then they would drive their car up to the parking lot, and then I'd send my phlebotomist out to draw blood. And the phlebotomist would go out in her mask and PPE and draw blood, and patients love that. Um, the, the, the interesting thing will be if we go back to the old ways um, when COVID does eventually someday uh, die down, or if we maintain this kind of efficient uh, pace and practice that we're doing now. Um, So many different businesses um, have become more efficient. We're learning we can save money by having people work from home. Um, It'll be interesting to see how how long we can keep this up, hopefully for a long time. Do you think that telemedicine will continue in the future, especially for rural practice? I sure hope so, uh, especially with uh, access issues, transportation issues um, that we face out here in the rural community. Um, Telemedicine would be a huge benefit to our um, to our patients. We already had telemedicine available in Texas for several, several years, many years. But to expand it to Medicare patients and have Medicare cover it would be a, to continue that would be a big thing. Awesome. And then I see that you've mentioned that uh, you have a hybrid system currently. How do you determine what patients you see in office and uh, who is still for telemedicine? Great question. So if patients, some patients want to see me, they, they want to sit in a room next to me, across from me. We let those patients come in. If they request to come in, we'll bring them in. They wear a mask, I wear a mask, all the staff wears a mask. Um, If the patient has a complaint that really needs me in person to see them and examine them, I'll ask that they come in. Um, Otherwise, we we give them an option and we try to do the the telephone or telemedicine uh, visit um, and try to get them to get their blood drawn out in the parking lot. I think now, um, as our case rate is dropping, we'll allow them to do a telemedicine visit and then walk straight back to lab and get their blood drawn. And then they, they can go without a lot of interperson interaction. So what type of cases do you like to see in office as opposed to having them in telemedicine? Well, if I have to do a procedure on them, I've got to see them. So if I need to take out an ingrown toenail or do a biopsy, um, if I need to do a musculoskeletal exam, um, sometimes the, the phone is not real, the, the, depending on what kind of phone they have and pixels and stuff, it's hard to see rashes. 
um, even when they do FaceTime or with, even if they email it. So I may ask them to come in and let me look at, at uh, a rash or something like that. Besides telemedicine, have other kinds of technology influenced your practice? You know, family practice PCP, we don't have a lot of million dollar machines. Um, the, the next best thing is, I don't know when this was made, but the x-ray, we have an x-ray machine from, I think, I think we bought it back in 1904 and uh, it's been serving us well. We have kind of a digital uh, printout now that we can use, or digital uh, pixelation that we can look at it on a computer now. Before we had to, uh, before I even came back, the doctors had to, you know, put the x-ray up against the, the light and look at it, um, which is fine, but it's harder to get a good view. And you can't send that out to a radiologist for an overread. With these digital type x-rays, we can electronically send that out to a radiologist if we are unsure about the diagnosis and get a response back that day, which makes it convenient for the patient. All right. Um, has COVID hindered the quality of care that you've been able to give to your patients? I don't think so. Um, uh, no, no. It's it's. In, I think it's probably increased the quality of care. And the reason is a lot of times when a patient wouldn't have come in because they just couldn't make the trip, they are able to seek care because we have expanded telemedicine access. Uh, so Dr. Morchetti actually has a question. He said, uh, what, it was, what was payment like before uh, for telemedicine before COVID versus now? So I don't have a lot of commercial insurance. Um, so I didn't do, and that was the, I think the premier um, telemedicine patient um, was one with commercial insurance. So now, but as far as expanded Medicare access, we have pay parity with telephone visits and uh, telemedicine, meaning video and audio visits with our previous office visits. So now we get paid for an office visit rate if the criteria are met, which isn't a lot. I mean, it's maybe 60 bucks or something. And then last question before we move on, do you guys use HoloLens in any of your facilities? I guess not because I don't know what that is. Okay. <laughs> All right, cool. We're good to move on. Okay, I hope that's nothing important. Keep an eye on the chat box, Rachel. Okay. All right, next slide. So I want to briefly talk about the um, Texas Medical Board because I knew nothing about it until about six years ago when I started my practice. And it, it's one of those things that you're glad you didn't, well, um, you're glad you never had an encounter with them when you learn about them. Um, the medical board, you can read the mission statement. It's pretty long. Basically, the medical board and its members are uh, there to protect the public safety and welfare. The composition of the medical board are 12 physicians and seven public members, so 19 total members. There are nine MDs three DOs and seven public members. So that is actually etched in stone. There cannot be 10 MDs or two DOs. It has to be nine, three, and seven. Uh, each member is appointed by the governor for a staggered six year term. So every two years, a third of the board is up for replacement or reappointment. This slide is fairly accurate. I, I think there's been a few um, deletions and additions since this slide was made. Full disclosure, I got this presentation from one of the general counsel of the medical board. So um, I'm gonna go through it, um, but if you have any real detailed questions, I'll answer it the best I can, which is pretty good. Um, oh, wait, can you go back? We actually have a couple more questions on sure. that. Um, so can you expand on some examples of non-physicians or public members that are on the Texas Medical Board? Sure. So the public members cannot be physicians. They cannot be MDs or DOs. They have to be seven people who have no physician uh, uh, degree. A lot of them are business folks um, and community leaders. Uh, just to look quickly on this side, um, Mr. Agarwal, 
is a textile tycoon in Dallas. He supplies uh, uh, bed sheets to, I think, a lot of the casinos and hotels across America. Uh, Ms. Sharon Barnes is an HR, uh, retired HR director from Dow Energy. Um, Mr. Gracia is a retired San Antonio police chief and real estate uh, businessman. Um, so that kind of gives you an idea of uh, uh, the public members. But it, a lot of them, so one of them was a teacher, um, just, just varied, but, but usually they have a, a community leadership role. So why were public members added to the Texas Medical Board? So the Medical Board composition has actually changed over um, its initial inception, you know, decades and decades and decades ago. Initially, it was just physicians and just a few physicians, and it's gradually grown to the large board that it is today. And a lot of the reason is that the mission of the TMB is to protect the public and so the legislature uh, found it important to increase the number of public members on the board. Um, it, it really keeps us, and by us, I mean a physician, it keeps physicians accountable. Um, we don't want to have a uh, circle the wagons type approach when it comes to complaints against one of our colleagues. And public members have a unique uh, perspective that they bring to the board and are a strong voice on the board in everything we do. Awesome, and I think a couple of our members tonight wanna to know, how did you get onto the Texas Medical Board? And I think some of them want to know how they can get on the Texas Medical Board as well. Right, so um, the governor makes, I think around 4,000 appointments over uh, a term um, of his governorship and there are boards and agencies that regulate so many aspects of Texas. So the university systems have a board of regents that's appointed by the governor. Um, the rivers in Texas have a river authority with appointed members by the governor and the medical board is appointed by the governor. So there's an entire appointments office um, in the Capitol that is under the direction of the governor whose sole duty it is, is to solicit people to apply to serve, um, vet those members and give a recommendation to the governor, who's our, our current governor is Governor Abbott. So I um, went online uh, and filled out an application and uh, touched base with the appointments office and um, the governor chose uh, the folks he felt were uh, qualified and uh, or people that the board needed. So you have 19 members on the Texas Medical Board. Do you meet up with all of them frequently or like how often would you meet up with them? Good question. The full board meets around six times a year, but we have um, kind of sub uh, meetings to review individual complaints um, multiple times uh, a year. So both. We meet as a full board and we also meet um, in smaller groups in preparation for our full board meeting. And we used to meet in person, but one of the COVID adaptations we've done is um, uh, these kind of Zoom meetings. And it is, I'll tell you, it's, I, I miss meeting in person because you, you get to build a, a, a rapport and camaraderie with your colleagues but there is something really beautiful about finishing a long meeting and being able to walk 10 feet to your couch and lay down on it because before <laughs> I'd have to drive back four hours and that was tough. Uh, does the Texas medical board have a certain number of physicians in certain specialties like a rural medicine physician, a cardiologist? Nope. All nine MDs and all three DOs could all be ER doctors which would put a smile on Dr. Fowler and Dr. Morchetti's face. But uh, actually one of my um, mentors, uh, Dr. Bob Simonson with the, uh, he works at Parkland with Dr. Fowler. He rotated off as I rotated on. It's always a road. And when I rotate off, probably one of you guys listening today, who knows, uh, one day we'll rotate on. Um, but Dr. Simonson, I, I talked to him a lot about what to expect and, and, uh, he was a, a, a leading voice. 
Dr. Uh, Margaret McNeese at the UT Houston uh, system was a, a really valuable member. She served on there while I was on. She rotated off now, but uh, we still keep in touch today. She was a real leader uh, and is an immediate past chair of the uh, disciplinary process review committee for the medical board. So you mentioned rotating on and off. Does it happen every six years? Every two years, um, a third of the board finishes their six-year term and either will rotate off or get reappointed. Awesome. And then last question about the Texas Medical Board composition. Why is there such an unequal number of MDs and DOs? Or was that just what happened this, this term? So that's state law, how that composition was made. And I think a lot of it is there are just more MDs out there than there are DOs. And so I don't know the exact ratio that exists in Texas, but there may be three times more MDs than DOs. And so they chose three times more uh, to serve. All right, cool. Um, yeah, let's keep on going. Okay, next slide. Licensee demographics. So what y'all may not realize is that the Texas Medical Board licenses way more than just physicians. You can see here, I know the writing is kind of small. We license acupuncturists, acupuncturists medical physicists, uh, radiologic technologists, uh, perfusionists, physician assistants, respiratory therapists, and surgical assistants. And this was um, not always the case, but the legislature periodically moves uh, people around uh, as far as uh, uh, licensees and who regulates what. But as of now, the legislature has um, tasked the TMB with licensing and regulating uh, these different specialties. As far as physicians, physician licensure issued, it feels like I have two scopolamine patches on again. <laughs> Let me see. There are 4,869 physician licenses issued in 2019. So y'all may say, well, what the heck? I thought there were 96,000. Um, well, these are new licenses that were issued. So medical students going into residencies will get a physician in training PIT license. Um, uh, physicians in residency going out to practice will get their full license. If a doctor in Oklahoma wants to practice in Texas, they'll have to apply for a Texas license. So um, that's what that number represents. This is kind of a different graph showing that there's 157,090 total licensees, including PAs and medical radiologic technologists and acupuncturists, et cetera, um, under the umbrella of the TMB. So a big part of the TMB is complaints, right? I mean, um, anyone can file a complaint against a licensee of the TMB. And if you look here, 2019, we had 8,799 uh, complaints total, which is about what it was over the past few years. You can see it kind of go up and down there. I think it's gone up um, compared to 10 years ago due to more awareness about the board. For complaint source, um, as you can see, the vast majority of the complaints come from patients or their family members. So anyone can complain, uh, but mostly it's the patients. Sometimes it's the patient's spouse or a relative um, who will file the complaint. It is a complaint driven process. So if Dr. Jones is supposed to amputate the left leg, but only, but then mistakenly amputates the right leg, the TMB under most scenarios won't know about it and won't get involved unless somebody complains. And if they do, then they'll investigate it. Um, that being said, you may be wondering, well, then how are the 6.7% of the complaints sourced by the TMB if it's complaint driven. Well, now because of the opioid crisis, there have been some new laws uh, enacted that allow the TMB to initiate their own kind of audit of pain medicine clinics and high prescribing individuals. They get a list of the top 50 prescribers of opioids and other controlled substances that they are allowed to initiate de novo an investigation or audit. Awesome. Oh, wait, quick question on the back one. Um, do you have any advice for our future providers to avoid getting these complaints? 
So um, I want to go back to this slide. So there are 8,799 complaints in 2019, okay? To put that in perspective, um, there were probably billions and billions and billions of patient encounters in terms of how many patients a doctor saw each day times however many days he saw in a year times however many doctors there are in Texas. So the actual fraction of or percentage you have of getting a complaint is very low. But going back to this slide, you can see that the majority, 60, 70% of the complaints come from some patient or a relative of the patient. So communication is key. Um, you want to communicate, um, explain. Uh, if the patient has a question, be available to answer it. Um, and you need to care. Um, again, to uh, repeat, if, you, if the patient knows that you care, um, they are less likely to have frustration and, and unanswered issues if you're available to talk to them. And I think that you can probably uh, ward off a lot of these complaints because a lot of the times the patient or family member complains, they're actually scared. They're not, they're not mad. And, and if, you can, if you can answer their questions, you can, you can nip a lot of that in the bud. But that being said, anybody can complain against any licensee at any time. Okay. Next slide, complaint by subject. 40% um, of the complaints you can see here are quality of care. This is like amputating the wrong leg or, you know, recommending uh, chicken blood to cure a pneumonia. Um, unprofessional conduct. This is a huge, wide range of issues from, um, uh, you know, screaming bloody murder in the middle of the hospital or having inappropriate um, things there. 4% um, are impairment. This is a big issue, uh, especially for medical students uh, and residents. If you have an alcohol addiction or drug addiction, the TMB gets involved. And the reason is, um, or the TMB has the potential to get involved. And the reason is um, it can affect patient care. So if you're a, a neurosurgeon and you come to work drunk, you know, uh, it it's, does not bode well for your patient. The TMB doesn't always get involved on this. There's, and I don't wanna go into too much detail, but there's a physician health program that you can self um, uh, kind of report and sign up to that's separate and apart from the TMB that will do addiction monitoring. Um, but um, we'll leave that there. I think that's probably as deep as we need to go for <laughs> For this so we have a couple of questions about some of the complaints. Uh, one of our members wanted to know, what was the craziest complaint you've ever heard? Oh my gosh, I, I would blush even trying to just think of something, just the, the most embarrassing thing you can think of and then multiply it by two. And that's probably almost the craziest complaint. I, oh. I, I can't, I mean, it's, it's so, there's like, it, it's just insane. But you know, the good thing is the crazier the complaint, um, the less often it happens. And most complaints don't result in a um, action by the board. Um, once you filter down through the due process for the physician and an investigation takes place, the majority of the time it, it's, it's found to be no violation of the Medical Practice Act. So um, don't, don't operate in fear, but I will say that all my life, my mom told me to be a professional, but I don't think she realized that professionals are governed by a board um, and what all that entails. And it's an important thing to know. The TMB is not just, to quote Dr. Uh, Simonson, uh, who was a previous board member, it's not just a place where you mail your uh, license check to every two years that he found out and that I found out and that one of you who gets appointed will find out. Or one of you may be governor and appoint people to the board. So who knows? Who knows? How much do providers need to pay uh, for the Texas Medical Board every two years? You know, I think it's around eight or 900 bucks. I think it changes periodically, but around eight or 900 bucks, I think. 
And then what kind of complaints do you see, like do you act upon typically? Everything in that pie chart is has potential for action. Um, and everything is, 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 every action is usually in proportion to the um, uh, violation. So uh, minor violations have remedial plans, which are non-disciplinary. Um, they are part of your public profile on your license website, but it's non-disciplinary. And now uh, with the most recent legislative session, it's wiped clean after five years. Um, if there's a more serious violation, you get an agreed order. Um, and in the most egregious of cases, you know, thinking about pill mills or um, the Dr. Nasser case, you'll get your license suspended. There are certain issues, certain things that cause automatic revocation of your license. And that means no matter what, if this happens, um, you're going to get your license revoked. And that's state law. That's the way the legislature wanted it. And those things are if you're convicted of a felony. So don't get convicted of a felony. Mm. If you're not, I mean, you can imagine the situation. You go through a couple, and this going back to debt again, right? You graduate, you got a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt, you're ready to start your practice and pay stuff off. And now you have an issue with your license that may impede your ability to make a living. It's, it's tough. But you know what? I also want to go back and say we're not perfect. We do the best we can. Um, uh, you know, care for your patient, try to do better Tuesday than you did on Monday and Wednesday than you did on Tuesday. And uh, things usually work out. I think a couple of our members are a little nervous about future practice and if a patient accidentally dies on them, uh, do their license get revoked if a patient dies on them? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. Uh, patient death is a part of uh, a part of a physician's career arc. And um, what you want to do is, again, it all kind of ties together. You want to make sure you did the right thing by the patient. If the patient's calling you and doctor, I'm running a hundred degree fever, what should I do? And you say, you know, stop calling my office. I want to go golfing right now. And then they call you the next day and I'm running a hundred four fever and I'm throwing up, you know, don't call me. I'm, I'm going to go watch a movie. It, you know, in those kind of egregious cases, you're going to get into some big trouble. But if you do the right thing by the patient um, and the patient dies, it's not your fault and you won't be held liable. Do you have any advice for future providers that may have to deal with the TMB for complaints or anything? You know, it, it's a really fair process and you have a lot of due process during the, um, during the whole thing. So um, guys, don't, don't be afraid. Y'all's future career is just so bright. Um, anyone who logged on right now at, at least in Central Standard Time, 8.39 p.m. listening to this, y'all have nothing to worry about. Um, uh, just work hard, keep your debt low, do the right thing. If you mess up, communicate with the patient, show them you care because you do care um, and everything will be okay. Um, it's a process and, and uh, uh, everything's going to be fine. You guys, I mean, the, it's just incredible. Uh, everybody's potential out there. Um, you guys, this is, it's kind of like, you know, when you drive around town, guys, y'all don't, y'all aren't afraid of the police arresting you, right? I mean, there's police driving around and stuff, but but if you do, if you do what you're supposed to do, you're going to be okay. All right. I think we can move on to our last Q and A. So if you can go to the next slide, sure. please. Um, again, if you have any questions about the assessment, please wait until after this last Q and A. We will show a slide about the assessment after the end of this Q and A. This session is still going on during the last Q and A. So please hold off assessment questions till then. So. Uh, so far, people have been loving your talk, just letting you know. Um, let's see. A lot of people are actually thinking yeah. about going to rule. Yeah, actually, let me butt in. Um, Jeff, what's the most common thing that doctors get in trouble with with the medical board? So the biggest thing is going to be standard of care issues. Um, you know, doctors who 
who, um, uh, you know, don't give antibiotics in a timely manner, um, take the wrong leg off a patient, um, who don't, so what the standard of care is, is the treatment that a patient gets when they see one doctor needs to be the same treatment they get when they see the second doctor or third doctor if they were to see those doctors. So if you're doing some wild-eyed, you know, um, voodoo on a patient who any other doctor would have just given them an, an aspirin uh, for their ankle strain, then, then you're at a little bit more risk, of course, of a standard of care violation. And there are some minutia guys that I don't wanna get real into, but you have alternative medicine and proper consents and things like that, that can allow you to do some things that are not in the super mainstream. But from a, the perspective of a, a student who's trying to go into medical school, trying to go into PA school, um, um, this is stuff that, that if you guys, you guys are at the stage where you're learning the standard of care, you're learning what to do. Um, so keep your nose in the book, study hard, you know, take notes and, and, and do the right thing and everything's gonna be just fine. Um, Jeff, changing tracks a little, is there a certain personality type that does better in a rural environment in family medicine or can just any old person go be a family medicine physician, especially in a rural environment? And if I can do it, anybody can do it. And y'all have <laughs> shown that from the first three slides. So if you have to have your, um, and I'm going to butcher this, but, you know, grande macchiato, a uh, double shot of something creamy in the morning and you, you know, have to um, uh, walk around the Galleria on your lunch break, you know, rural medicine may not be for you. But if you can hold your bladder for an hour in the car till you get to the Houston Galleria, come on over to Livingston. Got another question, you know, Brandon and I have been practicing medicine for years together. How do you deal with patients who honestly continue to do a physical disservice to themselves, not taking their meds, not following their diet, continuing to come back for the same problems and not improving? Clearly, it's volitional on their part. I know you, you kind of have to love them anyway, but how do you deal with them? So you love them anyway and you care about them but it goes back into the death and dying slide. You can't have your day wrecked by a patient who doesn't do what you recommend. You have to take satisfaction in that you counseled the correct thing to do and you have tried to prescribe the right medicines. And if you do that, um, uh, you, should have a, a, you should sleep well that night. Different subject. Uh, do you ever take vacations? How do you do that being self-employed? So excellent question. Um, I do take vacations and being self-employed, I don't have to request PTO time. Um, the bad side is I don't get PTO time because if I'm on vacation, I don't make any money. Uh, so there's no paid time off. But um, we have a, a call group in for that cover the hospital. So if I, you know, every uh, weekend we rotate call. And so we have call coverage. I have my staff uh, come in when I'm not there and they're answering phones and, and uh, uh, sending me messages. I'll take my, I took my computer with me to Alaska and if it can survive on Admiralty Island at Ibis Point Lodge, um, then I can go anywhere in the world and kind of stay connected. And I enjoy it. It's not a burden for me to check my computer messages or respond to patients. It, I love doing it. Hey Jeff, put your uh, political hat on. Do you, do you think rural communities go more unseen in the political arena? Uh, you know, I think so, but I, that's also why I think um, in the founding father's wisdom, every flyover state has two United States senators and, um, and we have the electoral college. Um, it helps keep these uh, rural states, actual states that are rural, uh, as well as communities, um, you know, that are rural in play. Um, you know, Texas does a good job, I think, in reaching out to the rural community and trying to expand access 
with uh, telemedicine. There's actually a um, rural health and development, rural health and economic development council under the uh, purview of the State Department of Agriculture that has um, members who make recommendations to the state legislature on how to improve rural access. So we have a lot of challenges in our rural community, but we have a lot of people um, who are working on some good answers. We've taken so much of your time. If you can stay with us for another three or four questions, Jeff, it would sure, be just sure, my pleasure. Are there health problems like hypertension or diabetes that you've noticed more prevalent among a more rural type community? You know, I, um, there are, so the chronic medical conditions, I think are impacting minorities harder. They're impacting poorer people harder and they're impacting rural communities harder because of the challenges to access. You know, we don't have an endocrinologist in Livingston that can, uh, that takes all the tough diabetes cases. If you're a tough diabetic case, you probably have a diabetic ulcer. You're probably disabled. You're probably not making a lot of money. You probably can't drive an hour um, and pay the specialist copay. Um, so there's a lot of challenges out there. Um, but uh, I think I'm working on it. Rachel will be working on it. And a lot of these viewers will be working on it. Wrap up pretty quickly. Firstly, are we the only ones who think you look like Elon Musk or that actually Elon Musk looks like you or is it just us? Well, I, uh, uh, I'd love to have a taste of that bank account. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he can really do what he wants. How's yeah. having a daughter caused, yeah, exactly. How's having a daughter caused you to think more about gender equality or inequality, especially in the medical field? Um, well, of course, she's going to grow up and be a, a physician, you know, but of course. Uh, of course. Uh, I, 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 it has caused me to uh, realize that dating before 30 years old is a sin. <laughs> <laughs> All right, good. All right. But, uh, All right. You know, a, a lot of there's a lot of physicians. There's a lot of female physicians in our town. Uh, my wife is one of them. Uh, we have Dr. Anita, Dr. Hutchinson. Um, female physicians, particularly female primary care physicians, are in demand. A lot of patients only want to, a lot of female patients only want to see a female physician. So these are folks actually with a full panel. Uh, these are folks that, whose panels fill up faster than, than uh, some male counterparts. They have some challenges also that maybe males don't have. Um, but uh, when you get on the, 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 professional level of an MD, DO, or PA, um, uh, uh, I think female physicians are, are pretty strong. Well, we, I know that on the admissions committee, we've worked very hard to uh, get to a very equality-based situation from the standpoint of gender equality from admissions to the medical school. Two more, and, and we'll be done, Jeff. Is there any case that stands out in your memory that you are particularly proud of, or perhaps that you believe was important to shaping you as a person and as a physician? It really stands well, out. I'll tell you. Um, so I do a clinic practice and I do a hospital practice. The very first patient I admitted to the hospital as a private practitioner in Livingston was a, I think she was 17, 16 or 17 years old, admitted her with a very severe UTI and she coded um, and had to be intubated. Um, the, you know, the Life Flight Children's Hospital came and picked her up and, and took her out. I said the, you know, everything just now in a few seconds, but it took like four or five, six hours total. I canceled my clinic, stayed at the hospital, uh, was shaking in my shoes. Um, uh, but, you know, I, I, the standard of care was met. She did well. Um, she has a, a defibrillator in. Uh, she sees me to this day. She's since moved out of town and still sees me. And that was a, that was a, a scary, rewarding, um, uh, 
uh, case that I remember. 40 years of my doing this, and I, there have been cases that profoundly affected me as a person and as a physician. And I, I look back on those and I'm just so grateful that I was, I was there at the time that I was. Uh, I work with the nonprofit foundation that is trying to get before the legislature physician orders for life-sustaining treatment so that people can actually write down exactly what they want at the end of their lives. And I so very much admire what you're doing with your hospice work, Jeff. Truly in your work there in family medicine, going home to be part of the community that raised you, you are truly take, taking care of people from, from their cradle until the end of their lives. Um, a noble, noble effort, Jeff. Uh, I guess as a closing, quick, quick question, what is some advice now? You've got a thousand people online listening to you. What is a one or two liner that you would give to the future physicians listening to you right now? Yeah, I mean, uh, boy, the, the, we have self-selected now the, the, the really the hardest working, um, most forward leaning folks are logged in at this time of night in the middle of the week. So, you know, I would say um, you don't have to be the smartest uh, person in the class. Um, if you work hard and you care, um, you're going to be successful. You're going to do a, you're going to do great in your practice. Um, you're not going to have any issues at the Texas Medical Board, um, and you are going to be the future of medicine uh, in the country. Dr. Jeffrey Luna, and it's esteemed person who is of Texas, from Texas, and serves the citizens of Texas, homegrown boy back home. We are so grateful to you for to spending this wonderful time with us. Uh, I want every one of the thousand people online right now to put a thank you into the chat. Jeff, you can watch them pouring in there. And uh, we'll wrap up the session. Rachel, you want to make some concluding uh, comments and uh, show them how to take the exam? Yes. So uh, for this exam, you need to go to questspace.com, enter in the pin with the dashes, and, and uh, find the pass. Uh, enter in the password. You don't need a Questspace account. The password is Livingston, and we've changed the due date, so it'll no longer be due on Fridays. It'll be now due on Tuesday at 6.59 p.m. Central Standard Time, so right before our next session. So you have more time to do the assessment and you have two attempts to get a 70 or above. We wanna thank everyone who joined us this evening to virtual shadowing. One of the important questions for the evening was, how long are you going to keep doing this? And the answer is, as long as you keep coming back, seeking for answers about your future we will be here. Dr. Jeffrey Luna, Dr. Brandon Morchetti, Rachel, our host this evening, and from all the working group here at Virtual Shadowing, we wish you a good evening. Good night, good night everyone. See you next week.